Welcome back. So now we're going to talk about, you know, fit and sustainability of competitive advantage. And some of you who have watched my channel before have already seen this discussion if you watch Portarian versus resource-based view of strategy. But I appreciate that, you know, not everybody who watches my channel is one of my students and has heard this discussion. So um, this may be a review for some of you and it may be totally new for others. So the whole point about fit, I feel like Michael Porter is indirectly addressing Jay Varney's resource-based view of strategy. And this is what we call it, it also can also be described as the Portarian versus the Ricardian rents. But let's kind of illustrate these visually and I think it'll make a little more sense. Okay, Portarian view of strategy, again that pursuit of competitive advantage, that um, idea of securing a unique and valuable position, okay, Michael Porter's original ideas, looks at the economy more or less as being finite in quantity. So in other words, if I were to draw, imagine the world economy as a pie. Right, this is a blue pie. I, I don't know, is that blue raspberry pie? Does anybody have that Smurf pie? I don't know. So you got this blue pie, okay? That's the amount of the world, that's how much world economy there is. And so let's say that I'm a company and this is how much pie that I have. This is my share of the world economy. Now, if I want to get more pie, if I want to grow, I have to take away somebody else's pie. It's the only way I can get bigger. This is what we call a zero-sum game. Okay, wealth is a zero-sum game. And by the way, in medieval Europe, this is the way that the world conceived of wealth. That if you had more money, then you have by definition taken away money from someone else. Karl Marx even talks about this in the Communist Manifesto, right? He basically says that Europe conquers all of its own wealth, so it has to go colonize other nations to take away their wealth. That's, that's a very old-fashioned sort of way of looking at it, okay? So let's say our blue company, I'm going to use Apple. I use this example a lot because I think it's very illustrative. But let's say Apple is our blue company, and let's say Microsoft is the rest of the computer market. So Apple has one of two strategies. They can try to like compete head-on with Microsoft. They can do things like reduce costs. Um, you know, produce better software. They can really try to just compete head on, but it's kind of a losing battle. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid and Apple products were kind of like for quirky people. It wasn't, they weren't like serious computers. Like nobody really took, thought too much of them. But see, Apple did exactly what Michael Porter is talking about in this article and what is the crux of Jay Barney's idea of resource-based view of strategy, okay? So whereas Michael Porter's original idea, strategy's pursuit of a unique and valuable position. That original idea is saying that competitive advantage is exogenous. So it's relative to other companies, your, your competition. You only get better by being better relative to somebody else, okay? But we're not talking about that. We're gonna talk about this whole idea behind fit. And so what does Apple do instead of trying to compete head on with Microsoft? Well, what they do is they develop a whole brand new set of products, right? They develop the iPod. So suddenly they get into music. And this is where Fit works really well. You talk about reinforcing activities. Well, Apple's computing platform worked really well with, as a way to distribute music. And then they use the same Mac operating system or a similar one to install itself into the iPod, right? So they use the same platform, but suddenly it's also being used to distribute music and it's being used as kind of a portable walk. So what happens? Well, there's this other market, which is music. And Apple creates new markets. So not only do they enter the music market and they do a little co competing with other music groups head on, but there are people that bought songs that would not have bought their songs otherwise just to put them on their iPod. Right? I mean, back in those days, you know, when the iPod was starting to become a thing, when you wanted a song, you had to buy a whole CD. Suddenly, with iTunes, you could buy individual songs. So there are people who would be buying music that wouldn't have bought them otherwise. So guess what? Now look at what Apple has done. They've created new markets, and they've entered those new markets. Now, they could have continued to fight with Microsoft for this itty-bitty little sliver of just computing, but now look how much more money they have. And then what did they do? They started saying, well, what if we started getting into like telecommunications? Because, and I remember watching the conference where Steve Jobs announced this. He said, I want a device for the iPhone 1. I want a device that is a small computer, a telephone, an internet browser, and a Walkman. 
Well, so then what do they do? They start getting into the phone market. And yeah, it's true. They take away a little bit from the phone providers. Yeah, they compete a little bit, but they're also creating brand new markets. Suddenly, there's a brand new market for lots of data usage all the time on the go from the phones. Suddenly, people are buying more music than ever before, and they're probably on the phone even more than before because it made, the, it made phones accessible. And then what does Apple do? They say, well, let's make computing even like more portable. Let's start designing tablets. In the meanwhile, they get into this whole other market. And they're crushing it. And they're crushing it. See how much more money they have versus they just try to compete with Microsoft head on? And you know, we talk about fit driving a sustainable competitive advantage. Well, Microsoft has actually kind of sort of tried to enter some of these other markets. Right? We talk about the iPod. Well, there's also something called the Zoom. It was like a Microsoft product, but it was very similar to an iPod. I bought a Zoom. I loved my Zoom. The problem is they tried to copy Apple. It had some different features, okay? In all fairness, the Zoom had an FM radio, which I really liked. Um, I liked the interface better because my fingers were a little bit clumsy. Um, I liked that better. But the Zoom didn't have a phone or anything like that on it. And it did have a subscription service. I think it was like 15 bucks a month. And you could download unlimited music. Of course, YouTube has kind of made that feature obsolete. But it was really cool at the time. So yeah, Microsoft has kind of gotten into the iPod market. They haven't really gotten into the phone market, I don't think. And they've done okay in the tablet market. Apple's still a much bigger company, though. Because Microsoft can't replicate that culture of innovation. What Apple did, especially with this fit, is they created new markets and then they dominated them. This is also known as resource-based view strategies. I mentioned from Jay Barney, or if you watch my videos on effectuation, it's the same concept. That's what Michael Porter is trying to get at in this particular article. Okay. So taking wealth from other people is what's known as a Porterian rent. This idea of growing new markets and expanding them is what's known as Ricardian rents. And we actually, you know, I talked about the Middle Ages where Porterian rents were the norm, you know, zero-sum game of wealth. A lot of that started to come into question once money, loaning money became a thing, right? And you think about this. Let's say I have $100 in a bank, you know, I've got $100 worth of deposits, and I loan $90 to somebody else, and as they're paying that back, in a way, that's actually creating more wealth. And so that's how economies and money supplies have kind of grown over time. That's another way to look at this Ricardian rent. But that's exactly what we're talking about with this fit and sustainability. Because Microsoft was not able to replicate the culture of Apple. Apple was able to continuously penetrate into new markets. And Microsoft just couldn't replicate those capabilities. Yeah, they could copy the tablet or they could copy an individual iPhone. But by the time they're actually able to replicate it, Apple's already come out with the iPhone 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're illustrating here. I hope you've enjoyed this video. As always, hit that like button. That's a thumbs up. Definitely hit that subscribe button and post your comments down below if you have any questions. I've got one more video on this playlist, and I'm looking forward to seeing you then.